All right, welcome to part three of my series looking at Russ Miller's The Pre-Flood World, Noah's Ark, and Dinosaurs. Uh, in this part, Russ will reveal his complete inability to separate fiction from nonfiction. The ancient history books are full of thousands of legends of man and various types of dragons, which their descriptions sound much like various dinosaurs we find their bones of today. So, Russ, uh, are you familiar with the historical documents, um, the writings of, oh, I don't know, J.K. Rowling, J.R.R. Tolkien, and McCaffrey? Um, they also wrote about, um, you know, historical dragons. Let me give you three examples of these stories. These all emanate from India. Alexander the Great, when his, con when his soldiers conquered what is now India 2,300 years ago, wrote that his soldiers were scared by the great dragons that lived in caves there. Really, Russ? Alexander the Great wrote that? That's pretty interesting considering, oh, I don't know, that Alexander the Great, there's no evidence that he wrote a fucking thing his entire life. Um, you know that the biographies we have of Alexander the Great, the old biographies we have of him, are all third, fourth, fifth generation, right? Um, it's known that some of his associates during his lifetime did indeed write biographies of him, but those have all been lost. However, we have some reliable histories written by people who, who did indeed see those sources um, centuries later and wrote, but re, redid biographies of Alexander the Great. However, what's interesting about it is, is that, oh, I don't know, none of them talk about dragons. Um, they talk about giant snakes that his men were frightened of in India. Giant serpents, 200 feet long, that they killed. Um, the only source that I could find of Alexander the Great with an actual dragon, um, outside of creationist sources that all tell the same oh, bullshit lie that you just did, uh, there is an apocryphal book of the Bible um, added to Book of Daniel, uh, Bell and the Serpent, that talks about Alexander the Great feeding a great dragon tar with nails in it or something like that to kill it. Um, in other words, it's a book from the Bible that your own church fathers deemed, oh, I don't know, non-authentic. Uh, are you citing that as a source? I don't know. Um, either way, typical... 2,300 years ago, 2,000 years ago, Pliny the Elder, a Roman historian, wrote that the elephants in India are constantly at war with the dragons. Yes, and Pliny the Elder also said that the best way to cure a headache is to strap a fox's genitals to your forehead. Um, the, what is it, the cure for impotence is to drink hyena urine? You know, I'm just saying, my maybe not a reliable source. 2,000 years ago, 1,900 years ago, Apollonius of Tyana wrote, The whole of India is girt with enormous dragons, killers of elephants. 1900 years ago. There was nothing mythical about dragons 1900 years ago. Again, Russ, Apollonius of Tiana wrote that? That's pretty interesting considering, oh, I don't know, all the sources I have state that it, that was a title of a book, Apollonius of Tiana, uh, by Philostratus, not the author of the work that you're citing there, um, which, by the way, relied heavily on Pliny's writings, okay? And in fact, was a essentially, in part, plagiarism of Pliny's descriptions of the dragons in India. Uh, what about the centaurs? Do you the, the book extensively talks about the battles with the centaurs. Do you think that they were out there running around at the time? Just curious. In fact, Marco Polo, just 750 years ago, when he visited China, wrote of the dragons that the emperor raised to pull chariots in parades. I hope you all are seeing the pattern here. Uh, Russ Miller pretty much will say whatever thing comes to mind to prove his point, no matter how full of shit it is, especially stuff that he's taken from other creationist sources without obviously not checking to see if there's any reliability to it. This is a great example. Marco Polo never wrote about the emperor of China raising dragons to pull his chariot, okay? Um... I know exactly where he's getting that from, or where he's getting the association from. Marco Polo did indeed describe dragons. He actually called them serpents with two small legs, um, with a single claw on them, and that in a region of India, or a region of China, they were eaten. Um, I don't know if Marco Polo had actually tried it himself, but either way, it's pretty much universally agreed, even by contemporaries of Marco Polo, that he was describing 
the crocodile, which indeed was a delicacy in that part of China where he was. Um, it's likely that he saw a stuffed crocodile and maybe modified, it was common in China, to taxidermy mythical animals, um, and that he therefore was describing his skin rather than his claim to have seen these things alive. Um, either way, nothing like any dinosaur that's ever lived. There certainly never was a dinosaur with two forelegs, that, two little legs that stuck out. Um, anyway, that's one point. The story about pulling the chariots isn't from Marco Polo's writings. That's actually from Chinese mythology about the celestial dra celest ah, celestial dragons that pull the chariots of the gods. Okay, not a reference to Danakin, von Danakin. Um, that the that the the ruling gods have a chariot and that they have dragons they raise to pull the chariot across the sky. That's the reference to dragons pulling chariots. Okay, it's Chinese mythology. It's not from Marco Polo's writings. You're mixing the two up on purpose, I'm sure, uh, because frankly, again, the truth doesn't mean fuck all to you. The city of Nurlu, France had been named in honor of a dragon slain there. They said it was attacking the people of the city, so they had to go out and kill it. And they said it was bigger than an ox and had long, sharp, pointed horns on its head. It sounds sort of like a triceratops, doesn't it? All right, this one I'm going to concede to Russ. It's pretty clear that Indeed, the uh, the Tarasque of France um, is, is, is obviously modeled after Triceratops. I mean, they're practically identical creatures. Um, there's no possible way that anybody could have sculpted this cat turtle thing without actually seeing a real Triceratops. Uh, it, it's kind of remarkable, and um, Russ's best evidence yet. But dinosaurs have been gone for 65 million years, so... Nobody ever could have seen one, right? Well, don't tell these guys in Monterey, California in 1925. This critter was seen fighting with seals in the bay the day before and washed up on the beach dead the next morning. It was studied and deemed to be a plesiosaur. It had a 20-foot long neck. Oh, the more beach monster. Pretty fascinating that you bring that up, Russ. You know, that was one of uh, Kent Hovind's little favorites as well to, to, to present in his seminars. Um, in fact, saying the exact same things that you said, uh, which, oddly enough, are completely bullshit. Um, surprise, surprise. You, your source again, Hoven, maybe lied a little bit, um, and you're just copying his lies. Uh, but I, again, I don't think you really give a shit if it's true or not, do you, Russ? Um, because, you know, unlike a lot of other claims that you creationists make, uh, we... We don't have to rely on an old black and white photograph as, you know, the only evidence for or against a claim you're making. Because, you know, what it turns out looking at the California Academy of Sciences uh, collections database, I found this. You see, Russ, we don't have to take your word on this, this find. We don't actually have to, uh, you know, accept what you say as any kind of evidence because of the fact that the specimen was fucking collected. All right? B.W. Everman, Dr. Everman, from the California Academy of Sciences, collected the specimen. The skull of this is currently on display, public display, at the California Academy of Sciences, where it can be clearly seen that it's the skull of a Baird's beaked whale. It's not a fucking plesiosaur, you idiot. Oh, and one more point I have to make here, Russ. Uh, your source, Shipwrecks and Sea Monsters, uh, cites a Dr. E.L. Wallace as the scientist who studied the remains and determined that they were a type of plesiosaur um, and credits him as a renowned scientist or renowned biologist and president of the British Columbia Natural History Society. Um, well, funny thing is, the guy doesn't exist, okay? There, first of all, when this, when that when this incident happened, there was no British Columbia Natural History Society. Apparently, it ceased to exist in 1904. Um, there's no writings. There's no journal articles. There's no books. There's no papers. There's no listing of E.L. Wallace anywhere at any time. A scientist, in fact, however, from the California Academy of Sciences did study the remains and on the site determined they were a Baird's beaked whale. This is the same scientist that in this picture I showed... Uh, collected the specimen that still exists and is on display? Well, the answer actually is no. You see, in the original creation, dinosaurs didn't eat people. 
Well, how do I know that? Well, we're told in the book of Genesis, to every beast I have given every green herb for meat. Evidently, everything in the original creation was vegetarian. Plants were made as food sources. But God's original creation had no death, evil, or suffering in it. You know, scientists might find this skull and say that's a skull of a ferocious meat eater, long, sharp canines for gripping and tearing meat. But actually, that's the skull of a panda bear who is 100% vegetarian. All right, strap yourselves in, guys. This is going to be fucking hilarious. So when I first saw Russ's panda skull, something about it struck me as odd. It didn't quite look like a panda skull to me. However, I'm not an expert on mammal skull morphology. Uh, so, as I tend to do when I see something anomalous like this, I contact an expert. In this case, I contacted again uh, the always wonderful Dr. Christine Janis at Brown University and asked her, what does she think of Russ's panda skull? Um, now, she replied with an email response, but then she went above and beyond and sent me a PowerPoint showing me where Russ is wrong on this. So um, let's have some fun with this. I'm going to show her slides, and hopefully this will um, show up and be readable. This is a panda skull. Like many mammals, even herbivores like gorillas, it retains moderately large canines, a primitive mammal feature seen in shrews, etc. But the arrows show how this can't be the skull in Russ Miller's picture. The premolars are not pointy, have flat, round cusps. No postorbital process. Broad zygomatic arch. Coronoid process of jaw has characteristic half moon shape with narrow tip. Hooked mandibular angle. Now let's look at the skull of a fruit bat on the left. The ways in which it's like the skull in the picture are indicated in red. Longer canines than the panda, but not sharp like in a carnivore. Premolars are pointy, but for, but for piercing fruit, not blade-like like a carnivore's carnassials. Note that the molars are flat, not sharp, round cusps. Distinct postorbital process. Narrow zygomatic arch. Coronoid process broad at tip, seen better in the insert below. Square-shaped mandibular angle. But the fruit bat has a much longer snout than the panda and lacks the domed skull. How can this be a picture of a fruit bat? Wait a minute. What if we squash the fruit bat picture a bit from side to side, then lengthen it in the up and down plane? Voila! We have our panda. Short snout, domed forehead, and now the teeth are even longer and more pointy than before. Hallelujah! And just for comparison, here's a, here's a, a cut out of Russ Miller's picture. You can see the comparison. So I again want to thank Dr. Janice for, for giving me those slides to use. I really appreciated it. Uh, there's no there's no ponage like actual professional academic ponage. Um, that was it was wonderful. So the question comes to mind: Why did Russ show a fruit bat skull and claim it's a panda? Was that a mistake? Um, what, you know, did he just simply grab the wrong photograph from I don't know Google Images and oops, I accidentally grabbed a fruit bat. Or is there a reason for it? This is a good question I, I, I would have to ask. Or is it more likely, considering he actually altered the photo to make it look closer to a panda than it really did originally, um, as Christine pointed out, um, is it possible that the an actual panda skull looks a little bit more vegetarian than, than the fruit bat skull? And since, again, he's speaking to, uh, well, an audience that, half of which believed man and dinosaurs coexisted, um, that just maybe he figured it would get by them. Um, but the funny thing is, is I found this clip. Before the flood came, the Bible says all the animals ate plants. You say, come on now, look at those teeth. That's a meat eater. No, that happens to be a panda bear. You say, now look at those teeth. That's definitely a meat eater. Look at them sharp teeth. No, that happens to be a fruit bat. That's right. You saw it with your own eyes. Fucking Kent Hovind recognized that that picture was of a fruit bat, okay? Hovind recognized it. I, I, I don't know. It seems to me there's something pretty funny about the ability to take something lifted from Kent Hovind and actually dumb it down. Uh, that's, that's a true talented liar, in my opinion. In fact, T. rex teeth have been found with chlorophyll stains in the cracks of the teeth, and chlorophyll 
comes from plants. Hey, Russ, any chance on a, of a source on that claim? Chlorophyll found embedded in the teeth of uh, T-Rex? That, that would be a fascinating study. I'm sure it was conducted by qualified researchers and published in a peer-reviewed journal somewhere, right? No, actually, you know what? Don't bother, because I, I know where the source comes from. Um, that was research conducted at the Creation Evidence Museum by Carl Baugh alone. Nobody else has seen this. No results have been published. It's just simply one of Carl Baugh's claims that he makes. You're just repeating it. You know, a fair question is what caused dinosaurs to become extinct? Since we discovered their bones about 185, 190 years ago, there have been about 2,000 different theories. You know, you scientists, the great scientists, well, uh, what's the other theory where uh, basically the dinosaurs farted and they all died from carbon emissions? Yeah, that was a great one. And actually one of the more popular over the past 30 years was that a meteor struck the planet, caused a dust cloud and a blackout. The plants died, the animals died, but there's really virtually no evidence of this uh, meteor strike, and it's lost a lot of its uh, standing over the last five years. Now that's actually an excellent point, Russ, you know, because there, there is. There's, there's practically no evidence of a major meteor strike at the KT boundary layer. You say I'm crazy, but I don't care why, because I am an ignorant man. I am an ignorant man. Oh, yes, I am. This fellow says, I've got a new theory, a lack of oxygen. Not an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. He says an 80-foot-long Apatosaurus had nostrils the size of a horse, so he couldn't breathe. Well, we find their bones. I mean, they had to be able to breathe at one time, which actually supports the pre-flood conditions with the hyperbaric effect. They wouldn't have had a problem breathing at all in the original creation if they had the hyperbaric effect in it. Here's a free tip for you, Russ. If you're going to borrow an almost 20-year-old slide or graphic from Kent Hovind, you might want to update the script rather than just repeating what he said about it, you know? Uh, like calling something from 1993 a new theory. You know, just saying. I have a theory. I think that about 4,400 years ago, God judged man's sin with a global flood that killed everything on earth other than the few critters and people that were on board that ark, burying them in sedimentary layers of rock that were laid down by water to form today's fossils. Hey, Nick, can you give me a hand here? That makes no freaking sense, okay? It doesn't make any sense. Dinosaurs leaving the ark faced a new and a hostile world. They had lost all those neat pre-flood conditions. They now faced a world with deserts and oceans and winters and summers and ice caps, and a lot of them could not adjust, and they went extinct over the next few thousand years. Seems like poor planning on somebody's part to me. Uh... I don't know. Think about poor Noah. I mean, he's what is it? I mean, they get the dinosaurs get off the ark and just keel over and die because the conditions are no longer suitable for their existence. He's kind of saying, WTF, God, I uh, I fed these things for a year for what? Well, some folks that are skeptics will say they couldn't have built such a big boat. Well, here's a picture of a giant Roman ship that was built in 100 BC. There's a man circled in red at the front to give you some scale. Hey, Russ, you might want to consider actually, you know, checking Kent Hovind's facts before you just repeat them without, you know, thought. Uh, the ship that you show there, the, the Roman ship, uh, is actually from Lake Nemi. It's one of Caligula's ships built in around 40 A.D., not 100 B.C. Uh, the ship was, what, 73 meters long, about 240 feet was the largest of the two that were recovered. Uh, they were... Uh, obviously not seaworthy. Uh, they were pleasure vessels for a very, very small lake, not designed to really travel very far at all. So they hardly are a model for how your arc would work in the global flood. Um, you know, just kind of think about that. Records show that the Greeks had a warship in 300 BC that was more than 500 feet long, eight levels tall, and contained 1,600 oarmen. So they did have the technology. You are talking about the Tesseract Conteres, which was a, a indeed a Greek warship. Uh, a couple of points, though. First of all, 
Uh, the, it, the ship isn't known. There's no historical, actual, physical records of the ship's existence. We have historical records of it. Um, it was described by several, including Plutarch. Um, and the ship was described at 420 feet estimated length, not over 500 feet as you describe. Um, but you know what? There's another flaw, another big flaw with uh, using that as an example or as a model for the Ark. Uh, actually, you know what? I have, a, I have a, an illustration from this great new game. Holy crap, Skeptical Heretic was right. This Civilization game is, is amazing. I, I cannot believe these graphics. It's like something out of a science fiction film. It's like being there. Okay, I'm going to move my trireme here. Oh, shit. What, what just happened? Fuck. The important thing, as described by Plutarch, is that the Tesseract Contaries was basically permanently docked. It couldn't really move. Um, when it had to be moved short distances, it suffered damage. Okay? It was meant as a show of power, not an actual warship that could go out to sea. Again, it's a shitty, shitty model, and it, it, it's actually exactly what's wrong uh, with your uh, Noah's Ark story. Uh, any wooden boat designed that as big as the Ark was supposed to be is simply not going to be seaworthy. Even if they did not have the technology, remember that God told Noah how to build the Ark and what to build it from. It didn't matter if mankind could make big boats or not. Well, there you go. Why didn't you just say that in the first place, okay? All right? If it's a fucking miracle, it's a miracle. You don't have to sit around and come up with physical evidence for anything if you're going to say it's a miracle. Just go with that, okay? Don't sit around and try to make it scientific then. There's no point in it. There's no reason behind it. You just demean your own belief system and science at the same time. Sort of related to the topic of seaworthiness, I suppose. Um, I wanted to finish the series up before I left. Uh, however, I ended up running out of time and I'm going to be I'm leaving in just a few hours I'm going to be getting on a plane going to Kodiak um, and from there who knows um, I'm going to be redeployed again for at least 30 days possibly longer I don't know what kind of contact what kind of internet I'm going to have uh, during that time period I hopefully will have some access and I'll be able to finish up the series and post the last part uh, this is going to be significantly shorter you may have noticed than my earlier video to Russ Miller because I skipped a lot of stuff that was either I'd already gone through or was just I was just bored trying to respond to it so I wasn't worth my time and I'm yeah I didn't do it uh, so I don't know when part four of this will be will be put up but hopefully sometime um, but I do want to get this one posted as soon as possible so I uh, I'll you guys will see me when you see me